My name is Sam Baknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. Executive way equals hundreds, sometimes thousands of times the typical wage of the typical worker. This income inequality or wage inequality is so enormous that it might lead to social and labor unrest very soon. And this is the topic of today's column. Before it is too late, Europe should rein in executive pay and cap it. Otherwise, it is headed towards a period of massive strikes and a decline in the profitability of its industries. This has happened elsewhere before. In terms of purchasing power standards, PPS, Europe is still way more equitable than the United States of America, for example. Copious social transfers redistribute resources from the rich to the poor, thus dramatically reducing the dreaded Gini coefficient all over the European Union. But, but across the continent, income, income inequality has been on the rise, and so has inflation a regressive tax on the poor. And such convergent adverse conditions always lead to increased labor unionization, labor unrest, and a realignment of the interests of stakeholders in private businesses, shareholders, which represent the capital, labor, and management. Recently, the United Auto Workers, UAW, won the battle against Detroit's big three auto manufacturers, which also own European production assets and automotive brands. Wage negotiations are an intricate dance. As the economist Richard Lester observed, these negotiations do not reflect only hard, cold data, such as productivity figures or profits. There is what he called a range of indeterminacy within which wages fall. The reason for this uncertainty is an information asymmetry. Workers don't have access to the big picture or even to other workers' output and income information. Workers are also often interchangeable. Workers are often dispensable. Many workers do not have the financial cushion to survive a strike or litigation against the workplace. Only when employees band together, unionize in a labor union, only then does their aggregate power right the scales to some extent. A Gallup survey of millions of workers in multiple industries over several decades found that unionized workers earn 10 to 20 percent more than their brethren who are not members of a labor union. Moreover, the extra pay does not affect economic growth, but it does affect bloated executive pay and bottom line profitability. Even so, wages make up a mere 5 to 15 percent of the cost of any given product. Wages are one example of the conflict between rapacious executives and all other business stakeholders. Managers are supposed to generate higher returns to shareholders by increasing the value of the firm's assets and therefore of the firm. If managers fail to do so, goes the moral tale, they are booted out mercilessly. This is counterfactual. <laughs> this is one manifestation of the principal agent problem. It is defined in it is defined this way in the Oxford Dictionary of Economics. Principal agent problem is the problem of how a person A can motivate a person B to act for A's benefit rather than following his self-interest. The obvious answer is that A can never, shall I repeat this, never motivate B to not follow B's self-interest, never mind what the incentives or disincentives are. That economists pretend otherwise in optimal contracting theory just serves to demonstrate how divorced economics is from human psychology and therefore from reality. Managers will always, 
always rob blind the companies they run. They will always, always manipulate boards to collude in their shenanigans. They will always, always bribe auditors to bend the rules. And they will always, always deny workers their just wages. In other words, managers will always act in their self-interest, period. In their defense, managers can say that the damage from such, such actions to each shareholder is minuscule, while the benefits of the manager are enormous. In other words, this is the rational, self-interested thing to do, managers would say. But why do shareholders cooperate? Why do they cooperate and collaborate with such corporate brigandage? In an important Chicago Law Review article titled Managerial Power and Rent Extraction in the Design of Executive Compensation, the authors demonstrate how the typical stock option granted to managers as part of their remuneration rewards uh, actually encourages mediocrity rather than excellence. But everything falls into place if we begin to realize that shareholders and managers are allied against the firm, not pitted against each other. The paramount interest of both shareholders and managers is to increase the value of the stock, regardless of the true value of the firm. Both shareholders and managers are concerned with the performance of the share rather than the performance of the firm. Both are preoccupied with boosting the share's price rather than the company's business. Hence, the inflationary executive pay packets, shareholders hire stock manipulators, euphemistically known as managers, to generate expectations regarding the future prices of their shares, which they then can cash on and cash in. These snake oil salesmen and snake charmers, known as corporate executives, are allowed by shareholders to loot the company, providing that they generate consistent capital gains to their masters by provoking persistent interest and excitement around the business. Shareholders, in other words, do not behave as owners of the company, they behave as free riders. The principal agent problem arises in other social interactions, taxation, for example, and is equally misunderstood there, but I will not go into it. Employers and employees, producers and consumers, all reify the principal agent problem. Economists would do well to discard their models and go back to basics. They could start by asking, why do shareholders acquiesce uh, with executive malfeasance as long as share prices are rising? Could it mean that the interests of shareholders and managers are actually aligned and identical? Nothing happens by accident or coercion. Shareholders aided and abetted the current crop of corporate executives enthusiastically. They knew well what was happening. They may not have been aware of the exact nature and extent of the rot, but they witnessed approvingly the public relations antiques, insider trading, stock option, resetting, unwinding and unloading, share price manipulation, opaque transactions, and outland outlandish pay packages. Investors remained mum throughout the corruption of the globalized corporate universe. And it is time, perhaps, for a hangover. You see, the good firm has been replaced by the good enough firm. Conventional economics is based on wildly unrealistic assumptions regarding human nature, and by extension, the conduct of human institutions. One of these assumptions is that firms, led by agents and egged on by principals, seek to maximize both profit and, productability, and productivity. This is nonsense. Firms seek to optimize, not maximize, profits by choosing the path of least resistance. As far as productivity, it depends on how fierce the competition is. Absent competition, there is no incentive to increase productivity. Firms invariably settle on being good enough, not best, until they are rattled by an external shock, of course. 
One way to remedy all these pathologies, therefore, is to introduce competition, both from within the European Union and from without. Perhaps 18th century economists were not so wrong, after all.